Howdy ASC Dallas, this is Jonathan Brower, your ASC Dallas Branch President. Welcome to our April Virtual Branch Meeting. Thank you for joining us this month. Before we begin, we'll cover a few branch announcements. Hello and good afternoon. For those that don't know me, my name is Nick Phillips and I'm the Branch Director for the ASCE Dallas Branch. I'm here to tell you all about what's going on with our fantastic bridge program. But real quick before I get into the announcements, I would like to thank our speakers from last month, ASC Dallas President Jonathan Brower and the Jacob Engineering's Manny Calderon. Jonathan and Manny gave us great presentations over e-meeting etiquette and e-meeting hosting. Jonathan showing us the best and most effective ways to host online meetings to make them engaging and tactful and fun. Manny demonstrated quick, useful tips on how to use Microsoft Teams that make user interface much, much easier. Thank you to you both, and we appreciate you taking the time. Now, for this, for this month, on April 12th at 1.15 p.m. after the branch's monthly meeting, we will be hosting a presentation over quality control mastery. The speaker for this month, who we're very excited about, is Marty Paris, Vice President from Kimley Horn. Marty will be sharing some of his expertise with us regarding quality control and just how to maintain a consistent, high-level workflow. As you all know, the QC process is incredibly crucial as what we do every day. As things get busy in the office and you may handle multiple projects, maintaining a high quality level of work always becomes much more difficult. So with this presentation, we hope to give each and every one of you viewers a better, more concise way to keep up with high quality work. So we hope to see you guys at the meeting. We hope you'll join us. And as always for this meeting and for those in the past, you can find all the videos on the ASCE YouTube channel. And if you ever want to get involved with the Bridge program, please contact myself or you can contact Samantha Vale, the YM chair, or Ed Penton, who is our president-elect. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you. Are you ready? This Thursday night, 5 p.m., we're having a super ASCE virtual scavenger slam. What? I said a super ultra mega chocolatey hype ASC virtual scavenger bash. Did he just say chocolate? A scavenger jamboree. A scavenger hunt virtually come on just just give me one please clap and john cena will be hosting inside the thunderdome compete amongst the greatest for the grand prize of a tesla <laughs> Stay in tune for the great ASCE commentary. See you next time. Oh wow, I'm impressed. I'm gonna go to this thing. Hi, this is Chad Ostrander. As this year's fundraising chair, I am proud to announce the sponsorship opportunities for 2021. Our virtual meeting sponsorships this year will include a two to three minute video by the sponsor company. This can be a produced marketing video if you have one available or any other form of company promotion. Our virtual meetings during 2020 have consistently received over around 500 views per month and they will stay up on our YouTube channel indefinitely. If your company is interested in sponsoring a meeting or the 2021 scholarship golf tournament, please contact me at fundraising at dallasasc.org or visit us online at dallasasc.org and navigate to become a sponsor. Thank you. And thank you to this month's meeting sponsor, Braun Intertech. How can science solve your project challenges? That's a question we ask ourselves each and every day. We believe successful projects intersect where your needs meet our science. We're innovators and thought leaders, problem solvers and collaborators. As a team of over 1,000 employee owners, our engineers, scientists, managers and field technicians deliver specialized solutions in more than 50 technical disciplines. 
we help our clients build smarter, bigger, cleaner, and better. This dedication to collaboration all began nearly 60 years ago when Jack Braun founded the company known today as Braun Intertech. He launched the company from a foundation of integrity, entrepreneurial spirit, and relationships based on trust. Today, we deliver the kind of engineering, environmental, design, and testing solutions that have made us the consultant of choice across industry and state lines. Into every project, every design, every challenge, we pour our best and brightest thinking. So you know every time you work with us, you'll be building your best. We approach challenges from a unique perspective and we do what it takes to provide the science-based solutions that will get projects off or in the ground and on to completion on time and on budget. Sometimes that means we have to find a new way to use science. Our labs are full of devices, tests, and machines we've custom designed to address specific project challenges. That's why, when a client partners with our science, they receive innovative design solutions. Our trucks have become an icon on job sites across the country. It's one example of how we bring the science to you. In the field, we use mobile technology to gather and deliver real-time data to our clients. That up-to-date information fuels our solutions. This provides the opportunity to help manage the project and gives our clients a closer look at their job sites. Without the best people in the industry, building on science wouldn't be possible. Our people bring their passion-filled expertise to a culture of employee owners who have a vested stake in your success. We collaborate to elevate our work every day and make Braun Intertech the consultant of choice. And as proud as we are about where we've been, we're even more excited about where our people and our science will take us next. Science never rests. It never slows down. And neither do we. As a reminder, the ASE Dallas Branch virtual meetings will continue to be free to watch online via our YouTube channel. However, we are charging a $10 fee for the PDA certificates. The proceeds from these PDA certificates will be split evenly between the ASE Dallas GBNAN Scholarship Fund and a rotating charity or nonprofit. This month, we will be donating to the Engineers Without Borders Bolivia Project. Last month, we were able to donate $1,042 each to the GBNAN Scholarship Fund and the nonprofit organization are calling. Thank you for all our members for your generosity and support last month. You can visit our branch website at www.dallasasc.org or click the link in the video description below to pay for and obtain your PDA certificate. These PDA certificates will be available for purchase until the end of the month. We'll now get started with our main meeting presentation. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to make during the presentation, you can type those into the chat box on the right of the video. To introduce our main speaker, I will now pass it off to our ASE Dallas Branch Programs Director, Carlos Balderrama. Howdy everyone. Today I want to introduce Dr. Lloyd Potter with the Texas Demographic Center as our keynote speaker for April. Dr. Potter was appointed the state demographer in June 2010. He holds a PhD in demography and sociology from the University of Texas at Austin, a master's of public health degree from Emory University, a master's of science and education from the University of Houston at Clear Lake, and a Bachelor's of Science from Texas A&M University. Woo! He's a professor, professor in the Department of Demography at UTSA, where he also serves as Director of the Institute of Demographic and Socioeconomic Research. He has extensive experience working as an applied demographer in several settings. His current research focuses on public policy and health-related demographic topics in training applied demographers. I will now pass it over to Dr. Potter to talk to us about demographic characteristics, trends in Texas and the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay, hello, it's good to be with you all today. I'm gonna just talk about a couple of things related to the census uh, before I kind of get into some of the details of demographics. But as you know, the census was conducted last year in 2020. Um, it was, there were a lot of problems with the census as a result of the pandemic. There were delays in the, in the field work, and certainly there were delays in terms of getting people to self-respond. 
And all of that then resulted in um, some delays in the major deliverables of the census. The first one is the apportionment file. And the apportionment file is the uh, data that determines how many US congressional seats each state gets. And so Texas, um, we're thinking is gonna get some additional seats, but that file was to have been delivered on December 31st or by December 31st, 2020. Now they're saying it will be delivered by the end of April. And then there's the redistricting data file, which determines, uh, so with the, with the apportionment file, then that will also determine the size of all of the districts in the state. So we'll, it will determine how many uh, US, or the size of the US congressional districts, like how many people are in each district, the Texas House, the Texas Senate, um, actually a, a fair number of, um, of boundaries that are determined or end up being determined by um, that are statewide offices are determined, the size of their districts are uh, determined by uh, the apportionment file. And the redistricting data are what are used for actually drawing the boundaries. And it has uh, geographic detail in there down to the block level. But that file now won't be delivered until sometime, they think by September 30th of this year. So that's delaying the whole redistricting process. Our uh, Texas legislature is in um, session now. The session will be over before September 30th. So it's likely that they will have to come back in a special session and do redistricting at that point. Um, the data file has uh, other information in it as well. So here's just showing you population change in the state um, and other states uh, so far this decade or last decade. In 2010, we had a little over 25 million. The Census Bureau produced population estimates, which is not the census count in 2020. And they estimated in July 1st, 2020, there were 29,360,759 Texans. That would mean that Texas grew more than any other state by over uh, 4,215,000. So we grew more than any other state and we're going faster than all other states except for Utah, um, our percent increase at 16.8%. And if all that holds true, then Texas is likely to get three new US congressional seats. So we're growing a lot and we're growing fast. And that's been true for Texas for at least a couple of decades, if not a little bit longer than that. When we look at growth, just looking at uh, population change over the last year, um, you can see that you know the, the Texas, the US estimate of population 2020, Texas estimate of population, says eight, Texas is almost 9% of the total US population, um, but, for the growth that occurred between 2019 and 2020, we accounted for almost 30, uh, almost a third of the total growth in the United States. So that's pretty significant. When we look at the population distribution in the state, uh, you can see we have what we refer to as the population triangle with Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston at the points. And all the areas are filling in pretty quickly uh, in between those points. If we were to uh, draw a line along I-35 and count all the population along it, that's and all of the population east and along it, there are about 87% of our total population is in that area. So that then means only 13% of the population is west of I-35. And so that highlights a dichotomy in terms of population uh, distribution and dynamics. When we look at population change over the decade up through 2019, you can see that um, you know, the most significant change was in the population triangle, but we also have population growth in the lower Rio Grande Valley, um, the urbanized areas out west in El Paso. But we have a lot of counties, 104 of our 254 counties lost population over the decade. So that's a pretty significant thing. Here we added more people than any other state in the union, yet we have <clears throat> approaching half of our counties losing population. Almost all of these, if not all of them, would be considered rural counties. 
And while I'm highlighting the West, we also have rural counties in the East that have also lost population and down uh, in South Texas as well. So what's happening in many of these counties is young people are aging up through high school uh, and then to uh, find work or go to uh, post-secondary education, they have to leave their, their county and then they tend to not come back. So they'll then reside in one of the urbanized areas that's where they're having children. They're not having them back home. And so at back home, the, the population is aging because young people are leaving and there aren't babies being born there. And so in about a third of these counties, we have what's referred to as natural decrease, more deaths than births. So they have the double whammy of net out migration and um, more deaths than births. When we look at percent change, which is an indicator of the speed of change, um, you can certainly see there are some counties in the rural parts of the state that are losing population at a faster rate than other counties that are losing population. Um, but when we look at, at it uh, more closely, you can see it's the, really the suburban ring counties around you know, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Houston, and the counties in between Austin and San Antonio, or around Austin and San Antonio, that are growing really fast. Um, we have Loving County way out west in Hudspeth. Loving County, I think in 2010, their population was about 83, and they added 87 people. So its percent increase is pretty high, but still there's less than 100 and, um, 170 people that are living in Loving County. Um, when we look at population change, um, this is just over one year between 2018 and 2019, Texas added about 367,000 people. Um, that would then result in an average of a, a little over 1,000 people per day. Um, frequently, I'll hear people say there's 1,000 people moving to Texas, but uh, they're not taking into consideration the natural increase component. So about half of those 1,000 people are children, um, um, babies being born. And then the other half are uh, domestic migrants and international migrants. Domestic migration accounting for a little more than a third of our population change in this year. And uh, international migration accounting for almost 20%. When we look at this over the decade here, we're looking at the same thing we were just looking at before, but now we're looking at column charts. You can see that 2015 was the year that uh, Texas grew the most. Um, out of all uh, the last decade. Um, and a significant proportion of that was from domestic migration. But if you look overall, population changes uh, by natural increase is pretty stable over time. And it's really migration that fluctuates from year to year. Um, when we look at migration and look at domestic migration and assess where uh, domestic migrants are coming from, California has um, for not just this decade, but also for um, some of last decade, and a significant portion of the last decade, um, led in terms of where the net migrants are coming from. There are people from Texas going to California, but there are net more people coming to Texas than are uh, Texans going to California. But you also can see that uh, Florida and Illinois are pretty high there. Um, and then New Mexico is kind of fluctuates from year to year. New Jersey tends to be pretty high over time. Um, and um, I think New York is usually pretty high, but le this last year it's not up there. And then I, at the other side, you can see Colorado, where we seem to be losing the most migrants to Colorado. Tennessee um, is up there, but it, again, Tennessee fluctuates from being pretty much even to a uh, slight negative. So again, you can see that there are large states uh, that are uh, essentially net senders to uh, Texas. And much of that has to do with the economies of those states relative to the economy of Texas, um, making it that essentially Texas is driving, having a lot of population growth as a result of economic development and, job and employment opportunities. When we look at uh, where the growth has been occurring, uh, here's looking at again, 2018 to 19, 
Uh, you can see Harris County added more people than any other than any other but two counties in the country. Uh, Collin County was the fourth most significant, Denton, Denton the fifth in terms of numeric growth. Um, and then you come down here and you can see uh, uh, Tarrant and Kaufman County and Dallas County. Um, interestingly, um, Dallas and Harris County both had net out domestic migration, um, but that was offset a little bit by international migration. And essentially most of the growth that's occurring in these two urban cores in Texas is occurring as a function of more births than deaths. When we look at pace of change, so this is percent change, you can see that um, there's a number of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area counties that are um, in the, the high rate of um, population growth. Kaufman County, the second fastest growing county in the country. Rockwell, the sixth. Um, Parker, Denton. Uh, so you can see in terms of the speed of change. And if you look here, most of the change in fast growing counties is happening as a function of more uh, domestic migrants coming in and relatively little from natural increase and generally speaking, relatively little from uh, international migration. So this is certainly something when you think about uh, infrastructure demand that um, when you have people moving into a, an area from someplace else in Texas or someplace else in the country, they're moving there and they need a house. They need a water hookup, electric hookup. They probably have two cars that they're gonna put on the road. And so it puts this instant demand on the infrastructure. And so when you look at these counties, if you look at Kaufman, Rockwall, Parker, Denton, um, I'm sure that you, you'll see that TxDOT is pretty busy there um, trying to ex either expand roads or, um, or change the, um, or build new roads. So you see pretty dramatic shifts like that occurring, but you also see you know, a lot of housing being built a lot of uh, retail space being built, and then offices, uh, because essentially what's happening is there's a lot of employment opportunities that are being created in these areas. Uh, this is just showing you metro areas. Interestingly, the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, metro area um, was the uh, fastest growing, uh, or I should say most significant growing metro area in the country. Uh, between 2010 and 2019, with Houston not too far behind, and then Austin and San Antonio um, rounding out the top, in Texas uh, metro areas rounding out the top 15. Here I just wanted to show you um, some patterns of development that occur um, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and what we're looking at here is the how age of housing stock. So. Um, this first um, um, map is showing you the housing stock that was built in 1969 or earlier. And notice it's all kind of in the close to the urban core. Then we go to 70 to 89, there's like a ring around what was the urban core built in the older housing stock. Then we go to 1990 to 2009, you see this, you know, another ring uh, out there. And then between 2010 and 2019, yet another ring. So essentially there's a sort of concentric development that has been occurring and that's likely to, to uh, continue. Um, probably I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we'll, we'll certainly we'll see uh, Denton and Collin County continuing to grow, but we're likely to see uh, more growth um, kind of to the South and maybe a little bit to the West and certainly to the East of the Dallas-Fort Worth area going forward. When we look at population change this decade by race and ethnicity in Texas, you can see the, and what first, if you look at the, the percent of the population by race and ethnicity, you can see it's shifting um, with a higher percent uh, Hispanic, um, smaller percent that's not Hispanic white, which is largely a function of the growth of the Hispanic population, uh, meaning, meaning there's a higher percentage, aren't fewer non-Hispanic whites in Texas. If you look at the growth and percent contribution over uh, the decade so far, you can see that Latinos contributed almost 54% of the population growth in the state. 
African Americans, almost 16%. Non Hispanic whites, even though they're 41% of the population, only contributing 13.6% uh, of the growth. And then the Asian population, even though it's only 5% of the population, is contributing almost 13% of our population growth. So the Asian population is growing very quickly uh, in Texas. Um, and then the, the non-Hispanic other is really just all other categories of uh, race. Um, when we look at international migration, we've seen a trend uh, happen post-recession where in 2005, we, you know, almost 70% of immigrants, people coming from other countries, were uh, from Latin American countries, and only um, a little more than 17% from Asian. Post-recession, we saw that shift pretty dramatically with a reduction in uh, immigration from Latin American countries, in particular Mexico, and a pretty su substantial increase in immigration from Asian countries. Um, so, um, and in particular, China and India are probably two of the biggest uh, senders of uh, immigrants to Texas. Here's showing you the age structure of the population. And, uh, and here you can see there are different shades that represent the different racial and ethnic groups. Males are blue on the left and females are red on the white, on the right. Um, and when we look at the center here, that's uh, the um, non-Hispanic white population. And if you notice here, there's um, essentially an inverted population pyramid where there are fewer younger people um, at the youngest ages than there are in the baby boom age generation um, up toward the um, 60 years of age uh, population. And so, so that's obviously um, something of concern. If our population looked like that, that and with a growing economy, we're not able to fill the jobs with younger people because with a growing economy, you need to have an, basically a wider base in your population pyramid than you have at the top. Uh, when, that's somewhat offset when we start adding the Latino population in, the African American population in, Asian, and everybody else. But you can see here in the bottom of this pyramid, even with the growing diversity of our state, uh, we have a declining population at younger and younger ages. So unless that's offset by um, uh, immigration, we'll have a labor shortage at some point as that those cohorts age into the labor force. Um, but Texas has had pretty healthy um, domestic and international migration that has essentially been offsetting um, the um, growing demand for labor relative to the supply of labor. Um, when we look here, I'm now going to just talk a little bit about the racial and ethnic distribution in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and so here you can see the Hispanic population you know, with concentrations uh, to the west of downtown Dallas and the east, a little bit north of, and south of uh, Fort Worth, and then little pockets of slightly less dense uh, Latino population around the area. And here's showing you the African-American uh, population. So you kind of see in, in the Fort Worth area to the south and uh, west, and in Dallas really to the south. Um, high concentration of African-American population. And then here's the Asian population. So here you can see really in Collin County, a little bit in Denton and Northwest and Northeast um, Dallas, um, significant concentrations. Um, so, so I'm showing you this. Oh, and the last one I think is non-Hispanic white. So you can see um, the areas that have high percentage African-American, high percentage Latino, pretty mixed with Asian because the Asian population is pretty sparse. But essentially you see pretty significant uh, racial segregation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, racial and ethnic segregation. And when you start then looking at the social and economic characteristics, you can see they're strongly associated with this racial and ethnic segregation. So here's looking at the percentage of the population or households that have broadband internet. You can see the Latino and African-American areas um, 
have you know relatively sparse compared to those areas that are Asian and non-Hispanic white. Um, here's looking at the percent of the population with a bachelor's degree or higher. Again, you can you can almost substitute these maps for some of the maps that I was showing you with uh, race and ethnicity. And then here is a percent of the labor for, force that works from home. Um, so, and this is this is data that were collected pre-pandemic. So these are not uh, representing um, all of a sudden there are people that are, are working from home because that, that probably would be um, much more dispersed if we were looking at it from this last year. But nonetheless, you can see that um, you know if you look at broadband, if you look at um, uh, level of educational attainment. Probably, if I were to show you something on occupation and so on, you would see, you know, pretty significant differences there. So when we look at um, at the um, some fairly recent information, this is kind of pandemic associated. The Census Bureau does something called a pulse survey, and so they've been doing this for some time. Um, since um, um, since the pandemic started. Um, but you can see that the number of households in the in Texas that report that there's some uh, or all of their um, work week will be teleworking because of the pandemic, you see Texas is kind of in the middle of the country in terms of the percentage of the households that say that. Um, here's showing you the different metro areas and looking at it over time. Uh, and you can see that the Dallas-Fort Worth area has a slightly higher percentage that are um, able to work um, remotely through teleworking compared to Texas and to the Houston area. And then when we look also at employment in Texas, uh, you can see uh, right when the, the economy shut down that employment really went down pretty dramatically. And it's kind of, we've been adding jobs um, over the course of the pandemic with a, a couple of um, period, four week periods that have had um, declines. Um, but essentially, you know, I think you look at this and um, what we would of course like to see is really tall um, positive values um, for most of these periods. But um, given the fact that we are, are in the pandemic and we're actually seem to be doing okay in terms of um, uh, adding additional jobs. And then this last uh, thing here, looking at, at the pandemic is something the Federal Reserve has done looking at traffic um, or essentially looking at mobility. Um, and so, uh, and they do this using um, cell phone data. So they have, um, they have been monitoring or they get these large data sets from um, people who are, are gathering data from um, cell phones. And, and there, I could go into the methodology here, but, but essentially you can kind of see that, you know, the, the zero is, is pre-pandemic. And we had the, pan, the shutdown of the economy where just about nobody was moving or it went down pretty dramatically. And then it's kind of recovered some and then here, this little decline is uh, the holidays. And now it's kind of picked back up. And I'm guessing if, and I don't think they've released anything more recent than this yet, but I'm guessing that we're seeing um, this basically coming back up to, not to where it was before the pandemic, but um, certainly uh, approaching. And hopefully by the end of the summer or midsummer, we'll get back up to where we were before uh, the pandemic in terms of people being mobile and moving around uh, these metro areas. And again, you can see there's a lot, there's variation from one metro area to the next. Dallas probably kind of down at the bottom and that's somewhat consistent with the pattern we saw of teleworking being more common in the Dallas-Fort Worth area compared to others. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the projected population. And here you can see um, this gold line is our most recent um, uh, population projection using migration data from 2010 to 2015. So we're basically assuming that fertility and mortality are similar to um, the patterns that we've seen historically, and then taking migration patterns over this period and applying those going forward. Um, our 
our projection, which has, currently has a 2010 base, is pretty close to where we think the census is going to be for 2020. Um, and then you can see that we're going to continue to grow, not quite doubling from 2010 to 2050, but getting pretty close to doubling our population. Uh, when we look at our forecast for population growth um, by county, uh, you can certainly see the DFW area growing dramatically. So certainly the four large counties are growing significantly. And then similarly, uh, you can see those sort of patterns at the other uh, urbanized areas as well. And then the suburban ring counties uh, also growing significantly, but not as much as these urban other urbanized core areas. And then this is percent change. So this is projected percent change. So here again, you see this pattern of suburban ring uh, counties growing fast. Uh, and then also we have the Permian Basin out west that also, um, you know, I think one of the problems with the Permian Basin is it's so dependent on the price of oil, and what's happening with the oil extraction industry. Um, you know, so our, our forecast there is probably, um, we make assumptions that essentially um, suggest stability and there is likely to be you know, a lot more fluctuation in the Permian Basin. Here's just looking at some of the, our projections for uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area from 2020 to 2040. Um, you can basically see the, you know, this positive slopes in terms of population growth for our, these four major um, counties in the DFW area. And then when we look at the smaller ones, you see similar patterns. Um, almost all of them having similar slopes, Kaufman slightly more steep and perhaps uh, Rockwall slightly more steep than some of the others, um, but still pretty significant um, and positive growth occurring. And then some of the smaller uh, counties growing a little bit less in terms of the pace of growth. When we look at projected population by race and ethnicity, our we're forecasting that the uh, Latino population will exceed the non-Hispanic white population probably sometime this year or in early 2022. Um, the Asian population almost at parity potentially with um, the African-American population by 2050. Again, it's growing very fast, even though it's a small percentage of the total population. And this just breaks out you know, our forecast uh, from 2010 to 2030 in terms of the percent contributions of race and ethnic groups. You can see the Latino population uh, forecast to contribute you know, somewhere around 50% of our population growth. And again, I highlight the Asian population um, still growing very quickly. And then uh, finally, just to look at the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, you can see that um, uh, the Latino population isn't contributing in our forecast, um, is not contributing quite as much as they are statewide, um, but the Asian population contributing substantially more and African-American population substantially more to the population growth um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So I think that's all I've got to uh, talk about. And I can if, answer any questions if you have any or. Um... Oh, oh uh, my name is Tyler Huynh and I'm working with LTRA. Um, I had a question uh, regarding like, I don't know if your projections um, considered like this huge migration from California and New York to Texas this year. Do you think this in, this will like increase like capital inequality or increase the gentrification that's happening around the Metroplex? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the Dallas-Fort Worth area, certainly you, um, you can see in South Dallas, um, yeah. there's a lot of gentrification occurring there. You know, with the growing population and the desire for peop that people want to be closer to, you know, the amenities of the city. And so, you know, if you want, if you enjoy the theater or art museums and things like that, and you want to live closer in to where those things are, 
and yet the cost of doing that is has gone up you know with uh, there's a supply demand thing yeah. so um so i'm living closer in and so the net result of that is um neighborhoods that have in in this case it's largely african american uh, neighborhoods in south dallas have housing that you know some of it's you know it's kind of interesting architecturally it's older housing stock as i was talking about earlier it's like mm -hmm. but um you know a young person or a person that wants to purchase one of those housing units and you know renovate it um bring it up to you know be more energy efficient and you know modern amenities within it um, they can do that cheaper than they can go and buy uh, a house in an already established upper class, upper middle class um, neighborhood. And so we certainly see that happening. Our projections do take into account uh, historic migration and the patterns that we're seeing right now are not that much different than the, the patterns of migration that we incorporated into our projection model. Um, so, so I think, you know, I think we're, we've done a pretty good job accounting for what we're currently seeing. Now that all could change in the coming years in terms of where migrants are coming from and how many. Um, but, but assuming that it, things kind of continue the way they are now, I think our projections uh, are holding, are likely to hold true for, you know, the coming decade. We will be doing a new set of projections here once the census data are released. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like 2022 will release another set of projections that are using more recent data. Do you think Texas as a government should like limit this or should we just welcome all all migration? <laughs> um, okay, maybe let's do a loaded <laughs> question. Uh, next question. I, when I, I, I mean, I think, you know, we, ha yeah, I, I showed you the population pyramid. Yeah. Texas needs labor and we need skilled labor. I mean, okay. we're increasing the kinds of jobs that we have are, are that are uh, skilled labor jobs are growing faster than we have the jobs that are kind of at the lower end of the pay scale and the lower skilled type, type, types of jobs. And so if we don't have people moving here um, that can fill those jobs, then then our economy is, you know, looking at, you know, potentially shrinking at some point. Um, but, I, but I'm fairly confident we'll see, you know, continued net in migration to fill the jobs that are being created. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Potter, this is Carlos. Um, thank you for presenting to our group today. Um, I had a, a question for you. Uh, early in the presentation, you said kind of a lot of those rural counties are more or less being uh, depleted because people don't really move back home as much anymore. Um, do you see like in the long term, these rural counties kind of being abandoned or, or you know, not being taken care of to a certain extent? Yeah, I mean, Just, I mean you can see, I don't know how much you get a chance to drive around. I, that's kind of one of my, I don't know if it's a hobby, but, but I tend to, I, both as part of my occupation, but also um, just because I um, kind of like going on road trips. I've been in a lot through a lot of these towns, and so a lot of them are, you know, you drive through in the town squares, you know, the the retail space that so used to be pretty vibrant. Um, actually, because when I was a kid, I would drive through some of these towns, and you know, you drive through on a weekend, and there's you know a lot of cars and trucks parked um, out there, and people doing business. And now they're, you know, they're um, empty uh, retail or, or the county or the city has purchased it and is using it as um, office space for them. So, so that, you know, that I suppose could continue to happen. I mean, there are a few things that I think may shift that. I mean, one is certainly, um, you know, the, the our urbanized areas are continuing to grow. We have, we will have challenges for growing substantial population going uh, west of I-35 simply because of water, but you can probably move water there. Um, but but uh, TxDOT is in the process 
of looking at building an interstate that kind of goes up through West Texas to try to, I think, feed off, um, pull some of the traffic off of I-35 that's going north to like I-20. Um, and so if they do that, that's likely to facilitate some further economic development in the Midland Odessa, Lubbock, Amarillo area. Um, you know, because one of the things that's key for development is, is transportation. <laughs> Um, because you're moving um, largely goods um, when you kind of look at, at any urbanized area, you know, there's a lot of, of goods that are kind of moving both to be manufactured or to be sold or, you know, so, so having uh, transportation and, and easy access are important elements of that. So if that happens, but that's, it's going to take a long time for that, for them to build that. Um, you know, assuming that they they end up building it, um, you know, so so that conceivably could turn around, you know, some of the um, fates of of some of the smaller towns. But others, I mean, you know, they many of them made good faith efforts to try to become uh, um, touristy places like Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg did it, <laughs> um, but there are a lot of places that um, are trying, and I'm not sure they're going to make it. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Potter, um, is it possible that the census data may get delayed further past your um, slide that showed that? And my other question is, what's the process going on in between delivered to the president of the US and then being delivered for redistricting? What, what's happening to the data? Is it uh, those are good questions. Um, I think the Census Bureau is um, likely to meet their the dates that I set. Um, they were um, before the um, shift in administrations. They were under uh, pressure to to meet their original deadlines. Um, I know the Census Bureau staff were very, very concerned about that because they just did, I mean, they take data quality very seriously and they were like, we're going to have to deliver a product that we're kind of like, have not been able to process and do all our quality control um, processes with it. So they were very concerned about that. And, and I think they've set these dates knowing that this, these things are important but also being realistic about uh, what they need to do in order to deliver a quality um, census product. Um, so, so I think that the file that we get for apportionment, they're going to feel, yeah, we can't get any better than this. <laughs> I mean, they've done everything they could to kind of clean everything up. And then, then the, your second part of your question, the apportionment file is just a count of the total population. Um, and it doesn't have uh, any geographic detail in it. So there's no, it's, there's not data down at the block level and it doesn't have any age data or uh, race ethnicity data in it. So those are all important things for redistricting. And, and that's where you run into accuracy challenges. Like counting pe just people is, is I think they they can do that pretty well when you do it on an aggregate level, but but when you're looking at um, at trying to um, assign characteristics to every individual, um, there's a lot of quality control things, especially and again if you look at how the census was carried out, um, the Census Bureau. Um, historically, it's relied on what are referred to as administrative data. So like if they knock on somebody's door and nobody answers, they can tell somebody's living there, um, but they don't, they're not able to actually talk to anybody. After a certain point, they stop doing that, or when they cut off data collection, they stop knocking on the door. And so then the Census Bureau will see if they can find data from a tax record or from um, Medicaid or from other, some, some other source of data that has information about the people that are living in that housing unit. And then they'll populate the housing unit with the characteristics of those people from administrative data. And, there, and there's other things that they do as well. 
but that's just one example of some of the things that they do to make sure that they um, have um, as complete of a um, accounting of the characteristics of the population as they can possibly get to. And that takes time. The other, I mean, they go through, there's um, what they refer to as deduplication. So it's like, um, you know, if you had a kid in college and they filled out their census form and then, and you didn't know that and you put them on your census form, um, there's that person is now, uh, there's two of them in the census data. And so they go through a process of trying to match those um, people that have been counted in one place and in another place, trying to match them and remove one of them from one of the places. Uh, if it's a kid in college, they'll remove them from their parents' household and, and assign them to where they were going to college. So, so anyway, those are some of the things that they're going through. And, and I think, again, they've done a pretty good job. I'm assuming from the people that I know there, they've done a very good job being realistic about what they can, what they need to get done and how long it's gonna take them. And so I believe they'll be able to meet the deadlines that they've set. Dr. Potter, this is Jonathan Brower. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you share this data from the Texas Demographic Center with entities like TxDOT, because I know in your presentation, you mentioned you know, all this growth in kind of the, the outer counties around uh, the Dallas core. And so TxDOT is furiously building. So I imagine that your office is constantly sharing information with them or they're looking at your reports? Uh, yes, I mean, so so we work closely with the tech stop planning. Um, I can't remember what their name is. The name of the division is does planning. Um, but we work closely with them. We work closely with uh, MPOs, um, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, which are do the transportation planning for metro areas. Uh, in terms of um, both looking at what their population base is and facility, you know, and making sure they're using what we think are the most uh, accurate and up-to-date data, and then also for their forecast and the um, distribution that they have of that. So most most of them are using our our projections at the county level, but then they have you have to distribute those people um, in a county. So, so going forward, so so many times that's done um, um, using what's referred to as a Delphi technique. So they're essentially getting stakeholders in the county that know about you know where are housing units likely to be built and how many and that, those kinds of things, where are businesses likely to be built. So they bring in developers and um, city planners and a range of things, and then distribute the population that way. Uh, and we work with, with them um, in, in many cases, we work with them uh, to review what they've come up with. And we're actually in the process of developing um, a, a model, kind of a, a land use based model for distribution of county level projected population. Um, we're still doing some testing on it, but we, we hope to be able to use that in combination with this Delphi technique. Um, and um, and then we work with the Water Development Board. We work with um, um, Texas Workforce Commission, uh, uh, Health and Human Services Commission, um, on a number of things that they're you know, when they're especially with their forecast related things when they're trying to figure out demand for services and that, those kinds of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Potter, we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, and it was very informative. And I think, uh, yeah, I'll pull the curtain back a little bit on on how these things happen in our state. So it was good getting to hear from you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's good to be with you. If you have any additional questions you would like to ask our speaker, please put those in the comments section below. Those questions and comments will be collected and emailed to our speaker later on this month. Remember, if you would like a PDH, for today's presentation, please visit our branch website or click the link in the video description below. This link will remain active until the end of the month. The PDA certificates will be emailed out to the email address you registered for the meeting with during the last week of April.
This general branch meeting is also accompanied by two institute technical sessions. Our sustainability group has a presentation done by the North Central Texas Council of Governments and their sustainability initiatives. The EWRI group also has a presentation with engineers from Friesen Nichols giving a presentation on course correction, getting the Farmers Branch Creek back under control. Both of these presentations are available to watch on our Dallas Branch YouTube channel and qualify for one PDH each. Next month's meeting is scheduled for May 10th and will be a virtual meeting that will be broadcast via our ASE Dallas Branch YouTube channel. This meeting will also be part of Younger Member Month, so expect the younger members to be leading that meeting and we look forward to seeing what they have in store for us. Thanks for attending our virtual Dallas Branch meeting and hope you have a great week. With that, I will adjourn the meeting. Stay safe, everyone.